here at Pivot. Um, what that means, um, I'm responsible for overseeing the movement of early stage inventions all the way from when an inventor, faculty inventor, is even considering inventing in an area and moving that all the way to ideally a legal instrument that has economic value and that confers a competitive advantage to one of our licensees or one of our startups. Um, in that role, um, we deal, of course, a lot with uh, university faculty. Just so, so uh, can I see a show of hands, people who work with the university faculty, are university faculty? So quite a few, yeah. Right. So um, that, that process can look a lot different um, uh, within the university context than it would, would otherwise look like. Um, two things, two particular insights I, I, I share. Uh, one is that uh, faculty have a different perspective and that a lot of them uh, place intellectual property, um, they allocate a little more importance to it than really should be. Uh, they view patents as a solution to commercialization rather than a tool. So patents are, that, that's not to diminish their importance, but they are a necessary but never sufficient um, solution to actually commercializing your technology. Um, second, uh, a lot of the times you'll see that uh, faculty will have competing interests. They want to disclose early and often, and that does not always coincide with the best IP strategy. Um, there are ways that uh, Rex and uh, Wilson and Cindy can help uh, mitigate those, but there are going to be trade-offs. So very frequently understand that if you're a faculty member, the decision to publish early can, to a certain extent, compromise your IP strategy. Um, and vice versa, understand that if you're working with faculty members, they're going to be interested in publishing early and often, and that very frequently, again, is gonna not put you in the best position. Um, that being said, there's a lot we can do to try to mitigate those things. And that's what we're, what we're gonna talk about here is trying to fashion essentially compromise and make sure we put ourselves in the best position to, on the, on the back end, have a good piece of IP that's going to be a tool in your tool set to uh, successful commercial Yeah. Hey, thanks, Ross. We really appreciate it. We appreciate the perspective from the University of Utah and to, to be here today. Um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll be taking, doing most of the speaking here for the next bit, but we'll have, Ross will chime in as well on some factors relating to working with the University of Utah. I'm sure so that's backwards. Let's go forward here. Nope, that, maybe I was going the right way. Okay, which way is this? Patent enterprise, oh, pals. Okay, here we go. So this is a, a roadmap for uh, topics we'd like to cover today. If you have any questions, please feel free to chime in. Uh, we want to talk about the importance of IP, why it's important for your, your startup company. Um, we'll have a brief overview of different forms of IP protection that are available for you. And then we'll look more closely at two particular forms, uh, trade secrets and patents, and why you might choose one over the other. Uh, we'll delve more in detail with respect to patents. We'll have a little bit of a patents 101 um, and then we'll look carefully to uh, two um, uh, distinct but very important concepts. Patentability, the ability to obtain your own patent, and freedom to operate, whether or not you are in a position to practice um, your invention and your technology without infringing the rights of others. Uh, we hope to look at a typical patent timeline to give you a sense of how the, the timing of this process and procedures and then we'll talk a bit about patent portfolio strategies. So, why IP? The short answer to this is um, it's really a necessary component in most in instances to enable your business goals. It's necessary to secure financing and really enable uh, a successful exit strategy. Um, in an innovator company, nearly all of the value of the company, especially at an early stage, is found in its IP. So this is, a, this is something that you can't skip on, skimp on. It needs to be done right at the beginning. So what forms of IP protection are available? So we list five of them here. Trade secrets, patents, copyrights, trademarks, FDA exclusivity. 
And uh, most companies use all forms of these IP protection to some degree, maybe not FDA exclusivity for all of them. Um, but for innovative companies, um, generally speaking, patents are really the most important part of, of their IP portfolio. So a life science company may you know, register its name, it might make effort uh, using trademark protection, or it might make efforts to keep day-to-day -day things secret for, and rely on trade secret protection, but it otherwise, otherwise it will pretty much rely on its IP portfolio, on its patent portfolio. So let's talk first about a trade secret so we can understand why you might choose uh, to pursue trade secret protection or, or patent protection. Trade secret is, um, uh, quite simply, information that derive, uh, in any form really, that derives economic value from not being generally known or reasonably ascertainable. And um, it is the subject of reasonable efforts to maintain secrecy. The most common example is, is Koch's formula, but if you're, for example, a life science company, it may be your protocols, your methods of manufacture, your internal procedures, your uh, uh, client lists, for example. Uh, the term of a of trade secret is theoretically indefinite. This can uh, be as good for as long as information is kept secret. And so as a general rule, companies should consider that all company information should be presumed to be confidential. And this is true for multiple reason, reasons, one of which relates to trade secrets. One is, I think, obvious to everyone here that um, keeping things confidential can give you a competitive advantage and limit access of that information to others. It also can uh, allow you to take advantage of, of uh, trade secret laws, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but it can also often be necessary to protect collaborator information. Oftentimes you'll receive information from a collaborator um, and uh, with an agreement to keep these things confidential. And so it's very um, important as a default rule within a company to presume that this information is to be kept confidential. Um, yes? Question, does it even make sense to keep a trade secret given that everyone could mass spec or NMR coke and find their formula and then patent it? And then you will not be able to keep to practice your trade secret because somebody else will get a patent on it. Yeah, that's exactly right. So trade secrets have some downsides here, and we're going to compare in a few slides here and contrast between the advantages of trade secrets and patents. And trade secrets are really not a good avenue for protection where um, either the, in the invention can be independently invented or reverse engineered. For this simple matter, is your, your secret will no longer remain secret if it's independently invented or reverse engineered. So in, in that situation, no, trade secret's not the right strategy to pursue. So generally speaking, in order to maintain trade secret protection, you should use reasonable efforts to maintain secrecy. Here are some suggestions here to you know, label agreements as confidential, to use passwords on your computers, to have company-issued identification. Um, we recommend training em employees on trade secrets and actually having a, a written um, IP policy that is uh, signed and um, also reviewed periodically by, by employees. Um, and by taking these measures, you can avail yourself of trade secret protection. So you might say, well, it's obvious that there's advantages to keeping things secret because others won't find out. But the uh, uh, trade secrets also provide a legal remedy in the event that your trade secret is improperly uh, disclosed or used by others. So, you know, this, and, and the remedy here is, is to sue someone for misappropriation. So when somebody improperly uses or improperly discloses a trade secret, something that you've taken reasonable measures to keep secret, um, if, if they do that, then you, have, then you can uh, go to court and sue them for, for misappropriation. And uh, this can happen when someone discloses or uses a trade secret without consent, without the consent of the trade secret holder, so without the consent of the company. Um, and at the time of the disclosure, if you did not have any reason to to know um, that the trade secret was derived from someone who obtained it through improper means, if it was obtained under circumstances that gave rise to maintain secrecy or limit its use, 
or that if it was derived through a person who owed a duty of confidentiality to the trade secret owner. One uh, scenario where we often see this issue arise is when a company uh, hires a new employee who has worked at a previous uh, a company. And that employee comes in with a lot of background information that has come from their previous employer. And the, the new employer wants to and, and really needs to ensure that they don't get contaminated with the trade secrets of that earlier company. And so we strongly recommend that employment agreements actually require that the employees affirm that they are not bringing trade secrets and that you avoid any, um, uh, try to avoid any risk of being contaminated with information from the previous company. So, so that's trade secrets. That's what we'll cover today on trade secrets. Moving now to patents. A patent is a very different intellectual property right. A patent conveys a right to exclude. And I'll stop here and note that I'm not uh, saying that a patent conveys a right to practice. It's a very different. A patent actually conveys a right to exclude others, and particularly of making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing the claimed invention for the term of the patent in the jurisdiction where the patent has been obtained. You can think of a patent as essentially a bargain between the inventors and the government. Um, in exchange for disclosing your information to the public, the government will let you keep others from, from practicing your invention uh, for the, a limited time. So uh, this slide here shows the, the boundaries, the extent of patent protection. So um, the claims of the patent are what define the scope of the patent right. So at the end of the patent document, and oftentimes people will get confused between a patent application and a, and a published patent. The published patent will have like a, the letter B at the end of it. Um, but the, the claims are the very bottom portion of the document. They have, they're a single sentence that define, in words, the boundaries, essentially what falls within the scope of the invention and by implication what falls outside of it. And that's the scope of your protection, what you can exclude others from doing. Uh, the term of a patent is generally 20 years from its filing date, but there are exceptions. So if you ever have questions, you know, send something to IP counsel to confirm if you think that a patent might, may have expired. Um, patents are territorially limited, and by that we mean that patents are obtained and enforced on a country-by-country -country basis. So if I have a U.S. patent, I am not able to enforce it against anyone in China. You would need a Chinese patent to enforce the patent in, in that particular country. And as you can imagine, it can be expensive because you have to apply to various different countries to obtain patents. So it can be expensive to obtain um, broad, uh, uh, broad rights outside of the United States. Um, as I mentioned previously, a patent conveys the right to exclude. It doesn't give you the right to practice your own invention. Um, you could obtain a patent on technology and still be in a position where you're blocked by the patents and IP rights of others. Um, which brings us to this next slide. And this is, um, this is really an important slide here that distinguishes between patentability and freedom to operate, which is often something that we see clients get confused on. So patentability asks the question, how does your innovation differ from what preceded it, what we call the prior art, and therefore qualify for patent protection? And there are several hurdles that you must overcome to, to obtain a patent. And we'll discuss these in, in greater detail in, um, in just a bit. So that's one question, patentability. A very important separate question is freedom to operate. Whether you have the ability to practice the technology you wish to, sometimes your inventions, other times whatever you need to, to, to practice what your novel contribution is, but whether you have freedom to do what you want to do without infringing the rights of others. And these are very different inquiries and, and uh, innovator companies should really need to strive for both, for both to obtain patents and exclude others and for the ability um, themselves to be able to practice uh, what they wish to. Um, freedom to operate, we'll, we'll, 
I'll, we'll talk, I'll talk just a little bit about freedom to operate and perhaps circle back later. Um, and uh, then we'll dive into the hurdles for patentability. So this slide notes that uh, freedom to operate is, is never certain and really requires an ongoing inquiry. You know, new patents are published um, uh, every week and you know, companies really need to have constant vigilance to make sure that they are still able to continue to do what they wish to do. Um, the benefits of, of doing these analyses, they also help you identify competitors. Um, they help you avoid infringement issues and it, and it very well can inform your IP strategy. And it can also help you identify opportunities to expand your own portfolio. You might see something that someone else doesn't realize, hey, we do this different. And it might be a, a mechanism for you to go seek a patent um, uh, yourself. Um, generally speaking, uh, knowledge allows for informed decision making. So this is a, uh, something we generally recommend our, our clients to under most circumstances. There are some exceptions. Um, so what happens if you receive an email from someone, a scary email from someone that says, hey, uh, we have this patent and they make you aware of it, maybe there's a, a threat or some insinuation that you might be infringing that, that patent. The best course of action is not to um, respond immediately, but simply forward it without comment to your IP counsel and set up a call to discuss. Um, and then you can consider response strategies at, at that point. Um, so now I'm gonna, we're gonna turn to patentability and hurdles for obtaining a patent. So this slide sets forth various requirements for patentability. Uh, the first is, is that the claimed invention needs to be directed to uh, what courts have identified as subject matter that is eligible for patent protection. Um, it won't, I don't think it'll surprise you that, that uh, your invention needs to be new or novel. Um, the more significant hurdle, of course, is that it must not only be novel, but it must also be non-obvious. Um, and it's, I think it's important to note that these requirements are obviously a function of time, right? So these are judged as of the date that you, your priority date, typically when you file a provisional or in some cases a non-provisional application. Um, the inquiry about whether your invention is novel and non-obvious will be determined based on the date by which your application is filed. <laughs> so early filing, of course, logically then would reduce the amount of prior art from which you need to overcome these hurdles. Um, and later filing, you know, uh, additional prior art will accumulate. And that needs to be taken into account when you consider the timing and when you want to file a patent application. Uh, the last requirement to note is uh, a really a combination of requirements that relate to disclosure. Formally, there are the enablement requirement and written description requirements. The gist of these requirements is that they, the the government wants to make sure that the public gets the benefit of this by you, by you actually providing an adequate disclosure in exchange for, for obtaining patent protection. And so you must describe your invention, that your patent application, your patent documents, describe it in enough detail so that someone else can make and use your invention without undue experimentation. And uh, that, that in such a way that, um, you know, one would have a sense that you have, um, you're in possession of this, either constructive possession or actual possession of the invention. One thing that I think is important to note is that when you really seek broad claims, of course you would like to obtain a patent that covers anything that any competitor would do. Generally speaking, when you are seeking broad claims, um, the disclosure requirements end up needing to be more robust for, to, to satisfy the disclosure requirements for for claims that are broad in scope. Um, we can take a, just a little bit of a look at these requirements in a little more detail. So the first requirement here, at least as we've listed them, is uh, subject matter eligibility. And uh, we could spend uh, the entire time and much more discussing this. Um, but the, the take home, what we hope you take home today is that the sub, um, subject matter eligibility is broad. 
most inventions can be um, uh, patented. Uh, we've kind of uh, listed some examples here, devices, compositions of matter, kits, methods of implementing software, hardware compounds, certain types of diagnostic assays, et cetera. Um, uh, generally speaking, there are ways to work with patent counsel to obtain patent protection on these inventions. There are, um, uh, while the statute is really broadly written as to with respect to what type of inventions are eligible for patent protection, the courts have uh, come up with judicial exceptions um, that make it tricky, more tricky in certain subject areas to obtain patent protection. And just because you fall into one of these regions, uh, I think it's it just um, the take home message should be reach out to counsel and think proactively about these issues because in many cases they can be addressed. But in, in some uh, aspects of diagnostics, inventions that relate to natural products and some types of uh, a software, especially kind of abstract ideas, these can be, um, there can be hurdles that need to be overcome. And so uh, the take home here is work closely with the patent counsel to think about this, but I wouldn't write off an invention uh, just because you've heard something about uh, limitations on subject matter eligibility, I talk it over more carefully with counsel. Okay. The next um, uh, hurdle here for patentability is novelty. I don't think this this again. I don't think this is going to surprise anyone. But you, if you have a patent a claim in your patent application or your patent that requires, as shown here, you know, these four elements arranged in this particular combination. Uh, there is a lack of novelty and you would not be entitled to patent protection if there is a single prior art reference that discloses each of these four elements in the arrangement specified in the claim. And if that happens, we say that the claim is anticipated or lacks novelty and um, the, the claim will likely be rejected by the patent office or if it somehow skirts through and would be found to be invalid in, by the courts. The, the, the more significant hurdle for obtaining patent protection is that your invention must be non-obvious. And uh, it's often a, a squishy term and you may wonder what that might mean. So the, the perspective from which this is assessed is the perspective of what is called a person of ordinary skill in the art. Um, in this, um, uh, the, on the slide, it, it's shown that that person is a hypothetical person. You can kind of think about them being in a room. Uh, it is imputed to that person of ordinary skill in the art that they will have an awareness of all publicly available um, information relating to that art. Um, uh, and they are. They, they have the experience of a person who has skill in this art, um, and they have ordinary creativity. Um, they're not an automaton. However, uh, they're not geniuses. And from this perspective, if you um, could think of this person of ordinary skill in the art, it's not a genius that has access to all this information. Would it have been obvious to that person of ordinary skill in the art at the time your application was filed, would, would your claim invention have been obvious? Um, and uh, the, the way this works out in practice is the first uh, uh, person who really assesses this inquiry is a patent examiner. So uh, when you seek patent protection, you file a patent application before patent offices, uh, typically the U.S. and the first. And so this will show up on the desk of an examiner, an employee at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And they will review your claims and uh, look to see and make an assessment of whether or not your invention is obvious. And this typical uh, examiner show uh, uh, demonstrate that something is obvious using one, typically one of these two methods here. You can imagine having multiple pieces of prior art and each of which teaches various combinations that together when combined would arrive at what you specify is your invention as claimed in, in, your, in your patent application. And if it would have been obvious to combine these references together, 
um, to arrive at your claim convention, then the claim is invalid and they will reject it. Um, one other option, of course, is that there is a, one prior art document that's similar and has many of the same features as your claim convention, um, but, but maybe not all of them. And if it would have been uh, obvious to this person of ordinary skill in the art to add this additional feature based on what was known in the art, then they can also make a rejection for obviousness in this manner. Um, so that's no, the novelty and non-obviousness rules. Any questions there? So now that we've, oh, and, and that, I guess maybe backing up, I don't have a slide on this, but there's also this, the disclosure requirements, right? And the important thing there is to make sure work with patent counsel to think carefully about whether or not what you're putting in your patent application is a sufficient disclosure so that someone can make and use that invention without undue experimentation. Um, and you want to think carefully about that, and that can inform the timing and whether or not you are ready to actually pursue patent protection. So returning to the question that we got previously about patents versus trade secrets, which one is appropriate for my particular technology and what should my, our company use? And um, all companies, well, nearly all companies will use a combination of both for different technologies and different information. So this slide shows um, uh, so one of the uh, requirements, so, so you, we should just think about the requirements for each, right? So uh, a patent requires the invention to overcome these hurdles we just talked about, to be novel, to be non-obvious, to have a sufficient disclosure, to have satisfy subject matter eligibility requirements. In contrast, trade secrets really just, it has to be information that you've kept from others that has economic value. Um, uh, the subject matter for patents is, is restricted somewhat, although um, I don't need to overemphasize that because generally speaking, there are broad avenues for obtaining patent protection. But trade secrets do not have these judicial exceptions to um, obtaining protection. The duration of course, patents are time limited. They will expire 20 years, approximately 20 years from the filing date. And trade secrets are potentially protectable forever, but as we mentioned, alluded to before, um, they can also be cut short. Um, and the procedure for obtaining protection is very different. One requires putting together a patent application and placing the invention in the public domain, whereas the other, uh, for trade secrets, simply involves um, employing procedures for safeguarding information. And then this is the big one here at the end, right, about considering the value of patents versus trade secrets. And this is the protection that each provides against independent invention and reverse engineering. Patents will protect an owner's investment, even if someone later comes around to independently invent the same invention or is capable of reverse engineering it. In contrast, a, a trade secret, you might keep it secret, but as soon as anyone is able to either independently invent it or reverse engineer it, uh, the value of your trade secret has been lost. So in thinking through the balance between seeking patent protection and trade secret protection, um, uh, one thing to think through is really an offensive strategy, right? Patenting allows you to stop others, even if they would otherwise be able to practice your invention, through independent invention or reverse engineering. Uh, defensively, there's also another reason to think about patent protection, which is that by seeking patent protection and it eventually becoming a published patent document, you prevent others from uh, seeking a patent themselves. So if they independent, if you had kept something as a trade secret and they independently invented it, they can seek patent protection and prevent you from doing it if you had invented it first. So generally, patent protection is clearly the better strategy for inventions that are easy to, to reverse engineer or independently invent. Let's see here, does that go? Oh, okay, it's stopped. Okay, I didn't realize this was going to step through this. Um, so what does, it, what does it look like? Oh, actually, this is actually, I think, a good spot to stop here and uh, get comments just from, from Ross, actually, from the University of Utah, because I know you deal with this all the time. Right, so um, 
As, as I kind of stated before, a lot of faculty will want to disclose, as is their nature. Um, as a faculty member, that's what they're employed to do. Um, that can make trade, trade secret protection somewhat more. We don't have trade secrets, and we and we very frequently will license those, and that is the uh, property of the University of Utah. But in many cases, that's it's not quite as robust as we like. That if we were in a, um, in, in a in the context of a private Yeah. Great. So, what what does a typical patent timeline look like? So, um, it typically starts out with the filing of a what is called a provisional application. So uh, you come up with your invention and decide that it's time to uh, proceed with filing an application. You put together an application that gets filed what we're going to call here a USC row. That patent, that provisional application will expire within one year. So within one year of that date, you will need to file what's called a non-provisional application or a PCT application that claims priority back to this, that earlier application. Colloquially, we typically call that a conversion of the provisional application. Yes? You can also refile for a provisional application, is this correct? You can refile a provisional application. So let's say you have a scenario where you file a provisional application, and the 12, 12 months later you decide or um, that you are not ready to go ahead and convert it. Provisional applications are kept secret and they're not examined so they're not publicly available. It is possible to expressly abandon or abandon that application and refile it. There are some, uh, uh, some tricky things to think through if you've filed serial provisional applications over time. That can, uh, uh, if you decide to abandon it after that, it can jeopardize priority claims in foreign jurisdictions. It's just something to be aware of, but the short answer is yes. You can abandon a provisional application and restart your clock. And as long as no one, you know, uh, as long as no one has uh, done anything in that intervening time period, you can restart that clock. So you just you lose your priority date. Yeah, and that in that intervening time period, frequently there is a own disclosure, right? So if the reason you filed a provisional application is because right after that you you published something, either, and I, I think we'll talk about you know, what what constitutes a public disclosure, but. That subsequent disclosure puts you in a, can put you in a bad position because then you're reliant and you need that priority date in order to make sure that your own disclosure doesn't enter the prior art. Yeah. So you would only withdraw that application if you don't have an intervening disclosure. And in most cases, for many academics, that's their own disclosure. So that may not be a possibility in some contexts. Um, so the, the provisional application and non-provisional application will eventually become public. That happens 18 months from the priority date, so from year zero to year 1.5. That is uh, when the, uh, both those applications will become public. And it's, a, it's an important date because when these become public, these documents can later serve as prior art against you for later filings. So this is often a date, this one and a half year mark, to really think carefully um, is there something that I've, I'm missing or should I supplement here or is there an improvement that has been made that might not be an, an obvious, uh, uh, a non-obvious improvement. This might be the right time to actually file that uh, second application before these earlier applications publish. So we wanted to note that on the timeline. Uh, oh yeah, that one year period you can run experiments, improve disclosure, there, they won't be the you can add, you can, the non-provisional need not be exactly the same as the provisional application. Step four occurs at the 30 month mark. So two and a half years after filing of your provisional application, um, assuming you filed a PCT application, you will then be required to uh, choose uh, whether or not you want to pursue patent protection in jurisdictions outside of the United States, in foreign jurisdictions. So a PCT application is uh, it's an international application and essentially serves as a placeholder. So you file that application at the one year mark and you can delay your decision about which jurisdictions you want to enter into until the 30 month mark. And at that, this can be an expensive process and, and you'll need to think through which jurisdictions you want to enter into. Um, so that's, that's that time period. Then, um, Typically, the time frame for obtaining a U.S. patent, assuming that 
prosecution goes well and you're able to overcome those other additional hurdles we've talked about previously, typically you can expect in this time is about how long afterwards you'd see your first US patent to be granted. And then this pink area would show usually foreign protection lags a little bit after that. And as I mentioned earlier, patent protection extends for 20 years, and it extends from 20 years from the filing of your non-provisional application, not your provisional application, so that's out to year 21. Okay. So um, that, that's kind of the timeline for a single patent family. Um, you might uh, want to think about also, what does this mean for, uh, what really the goal is, is to obtain a broad patent portfolio that will have multiple patent families, each of which expires at different times and allows you to obtain patent protection far into the future, even beyond the, the, the 20 years after your filing of your first application. Um, so this shows, you know, typically a first patent family, this is uh, the family that protects a really key scientific discovery. It might be the discovery that really launched your, 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 your new business entity. Uh, generally speaking, you, you try and seek for broad claims that protect this and the entire notion of this new invention and concept. And in many cases, this is, could even be in license. And often, it's in license from a university. Um, so that's, that's what we see for like a first patent. Um, a second patent family, again, sometimes this is filed uh, right before the first patent family publishes. Um, if, 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 the, if the new feature here is a non-obvious one over what was in the earlier case, this could be delayed somewhat. Um, and this you know, will often protect a key improvement or an optimized product. And then you'll have third, fourth, fifth, and many um, additional patent families that will protect um, for example, a perfected commercial product or different products that you that your company might work with. And as you can see, the, each of these arrows push out the time frame to the future and allow you to extend patent protection for a long period of time. So you'll want to think carefully about when is the right time to file a patent application to be able to provide the maximum term and to, to layer these things. Uh, sometimes in the university context, you, you have to publish, but in the case of Spinouts usually these the first one might be in licensed technology from the university, but later patent families are usually um, IP that might be owned by the, the spinout company itself. Um, we note here we won't get into this in detail, but the FDA does allow um, an extension of you can choose so for patents that cover products that require you to go through FDA approval. There is a process by which the term of your patent can be extended to compensate for the time that you would have been in, on the market but had to instead go through FDA regulatory delay. And that's capped at uh, five years and you can really choose one patent and there's complications to choosing that. But you'll want to think carefully if you are um, working on a company that requires FDA approval, is there a patent family we can file that we can think that we can tack on these extra five years to? It's a maximum of five years, I should say. Um, this slide here, uh, we talked a little bit about this already, but I think it's important to make sure that everyone's on the same page with respect to uh, the distinction between provisional applications and non-provisional applications. So as I mentioned previously, provisional application, it does not start the 20-year clock of patent term. So for many companies, it's a no-brainer. To file a, a provisional application gives you a year, you can uh, see how the technology goes, but you also uh, extend, effectively extend your patent term one year into the future by proceeding with first filing a provisional application. In contrast, non-provisional applications uh, start the 20-year clock for patent term immediately. Um, so this gets into the queue immediately, and you know, typically you know, after about two to four years of examination in the US, you might, uh, that, that's typically how long examination takes before something gets issued. Um, but there are strategies for accelerating prosecution such to get this time frame down to about one year from the time of filing the non-provisional application. Um, provisional applications are not examined, in contrast, and they expire in one year, as we mentioned. You must 
quote unquote convert them, file a non provisional that claims priority to them. And th this is an important feature. If there is an intervening disclosure between the filing of your provisional application and the non provisional application, then the patent office and courts will look to whether or not your disclosure in that provisional application was uh, sufficient to support the claims that you later want from it. So there are, um, I'm sure Ross will have comments on this in a bit. Uh, don't think of it, we don't, let's just go to this slide. Try to avoid potential pitfalls of provisional patent applications. It is important to note the same that provisional applica applications have the same legal standard for technical disclosure in detail as regular patent applications. So if your provisional is to be of any effect, it needs to have sufficient disclosure to provide support for those claims. To the extent it doesn't, it's not going to be of much use to you. So don't treat provisional applications as a shortcut. Um, it, it often gives, we see people who get a false sense of security. They say we filed a provisional application, we're covered. Um, but oftentimes that provisional application may not be in good shape. It may not disclose the invention well. It may not have claims to subject matter that you care about. And um, eventually, assuming these, this provisional application publishes or you have an intervening public disclosure, you could, uh, ill-prepared provisional applications can prevent you from obtaining patent protection um, that you later want. So uh, try to avoid this pitfall. Um, I alluded to this earlier is beware of filing serial provisional applications with overlapping disclosure if there is some risk that you won't convert the application. This is due to some you know, arcane legal rules here. But if you are going to file one provisional application and then you two months later you have a new invention, you need to file a, a second provisional and a third provisional, um, uh, just make sure that you're going to do that, that you have full intent that you're going to actually convert within a year. It makes it, there are drawbacks to withdrawing the application at that stage if you file serial uh, provisional applications without withdrawing your, your case. So generally speaking, um, their, their strategy that goes into when to file, but, but as a general rule, we recommend filing as early as you can, provide an enabling disclosure, and then following up within that year afterward that you can even make a more robust filing when you file your non-provisional application. And Ross, I'm sure you have tons of comments here. Let's uh, yeah, we've, this. we've This is kind of our bread and butter here because we frequently deal with this um, where, where uh, faculty come to us and will disclose when the invention is in a very early stage and then ready to publish, but it's not perhaps in a, in, a, in a position where we would want to actually file a patent on it and we're lacking a lot of that enablement or written description support. So um, just like you know, it, it's a good idea to file early to try to minimize prior art and that makes your job or Rex's job and overcoming obviousness a lot easier. Um, if you file too early, on, and when you say an ill-prepared patent application, it's not just that, hey, you didn't sink enough money into that application. It's that the invention itself was not yet advanced to the state where someone actually could prepare an application on this. So a lot of times we'll see uh, poster presentations, uh, PowerPoints, yes, we can file those, understand if your invention changes after that, and then Rex is trying to prepare a set of claims on the commercial embodiment of the invention. An examiner is gonna compare those claims to the poster that you put on file. And it's very possible that that examiner can say, this does not provide adequate enablement, written description support, this poster is not good enough. But that poster is good enough to reject it under an obviousness rationale. So we do have faculty members or inventors who, similar to a serial provisional, will think that, oh, uh, well, I just need to have my law firm put in place a cover sheet provisional in place of every disclosure. As long as they're good at playing whack-a-mole, we're fine. And that couldn't be further from the truth, because really what you've done is a, a series of progressive disclosures where the previous one doesn't have written description support, but it's a great prior art reference. So, it, it, in the tech transfer con context, we frequently deal with where we're, we're looking at a, a provisional that we have placed on file that probably isn't going to be very useful commercially, but it serves as a great prior art reference. Yeah. 
Yes. The question. Um, so, so what would be example of ill-prepared provisional application that become a prior uh, obstacle to later uh, filing of the final application? Uh, so, so oftentimes what you'll have is an ill-prepared patent application that doesn't provide support for for the claims that you you wish for. But you have 12 months after filing to add more details into your patent application. Sorry, can you say that again? You have 12 months after filing oh, your yes. patent application to add more oh, You're right. It, it, so it, it, the, the provisional application itself, uh, as long as it's not converted, will never become a prior art against you. And if you clean it up within the 12 months, you, you should be um, uh, fine. The, the concern is, is really an, an, er, an, uh, an ill-prepared patent application um, even, and this typically happens when it's ill-prepared, even at the non-provisional stage, it will become public and then can become a prior obstacle. More In the context here, what we more often see is that a, a disclosure that's very similar to what was in the provisional application is also published in another forum. And that's the document that ends up uh, serving as the prior art obstacle against you. So it's a good question. So unless there is no publication, there is no public disclosure, your provisional application, even maybe if you prepare and have all the details, will not be an obstacle to that's, that's a good point. It's a good clarifying point. It will not. Okay. That's, that's correct. The, it's not the filing that causes the problem. It's the publication after the filing that then kind of almost locks you into just you know, what you had in that provisional. Then, then you're limited to what you've enabled within that, within that first file. Good clarification. Yeah. We're discussing prior art in the sense of publication. Do you mean scientifically, like a manuscript or an abstract or something? Yeah. Uh, uh, is that the next slide? No. Let's. I'm going to jump ahead to this one to talk about what we really mean when we say what could be prior art against you. What type of disclosures? So I'll just go through the slide and I'll, I'll hit this point. The first is, is that, as a practical matter, you must file your patent application before any public disclosure or offer for sale, um, so especially if you want to seek protection outside of the U.S. So if we're being technical, in the U.S. there is a, a one-year grace, personal grace period that applies to you, but not if someone reads, your, reads what you do and does something analogous to it. Um, but in many ex-U.S. jurisdictions, there is no grace period. It requires absolute novelty. So um, any disclosure that you make uh, that precedes your filing of your patent application uh, could serve it, will serve as prior art and can validate it. And given that most companies really seek protection not only within the U.S. but outside of the U.S., as a practical matter, you need to get your application on file before there's any public disclosure. Now, I think your question was, was a separate one, is what really constitutes a public disclosure? And yes, formal, of course, formal academic publications will constitute public disclosure, um, but also abstracts or presentations that you make to the public. Um, there's, there's, in some instances, there is case law suggesting that even grants can uh, become disclosures. Social media posts, um, putting things on social media, um, things like that can constitute, the, the real question is whether it's the language of the statute is whether it's um, publicly disclosed, accessible to the public. And so it can be any type of um, uh, disclosure that can uh, be problematic. So in, in, in practice, it's best to prevent unwanted disclosure. Keep quiet if you can for business reasons. Um, use non-disclosure agreements to, to create a presumption of confidential non-public disclosure and really get your application on file before you ideally even talk to anyone in a confidential manner, but certainly before there's any public disclosure. And yeah. Yeah, a few pitfalls there. We frequently will see um, a submission for a conference. You'll have to submit an abstract. Those might publish several re weeks early. We've been burned on that before. Um, similar to publications, sometimes that they get published online before the official publication date. That also constitutes a public disclosure. Um, additionally, it's the, the inquiry is not whether someone did see it, it's whether someone could have. 
So even if an abstract is posted online and you can prove that no one actually saw it, it doesn't help to take it down. The damage has already been done. So, and theoretically, if you gave a presentation to an empty room and somebody could have been in the audience, that's technically public disclosure. Well, what are XUX jurisdictions? XUX jurisdictions? I'm just staying outside the United States. Europe, China. Um, uh, so, for example, Europe has a strict uh, novelty requirement, and that's the principal other major jurisdiction. So it's non-US jurisdictions? Non-US, okay. that's right. Yeah, there are some other countries that do have similar grace periods, but honestly, I don't remember what they are because anytime we don't catch something, it's, it's from a commercial perspective, it's safe to assume that they were only left with US rights. So, yeah. The question for the public disclosure. I guess usually if we have like a seminar or a small committee meeting for the students within the university, all the members in the university, it is not a public disclosure, right? Yeah, yeah, something like a lab meeting that's completely internal to the university. Yes, that, that's not considered a public disclosure. Um, the, yeah, the, the, the criterion is a, a reasonable expectation of privacy. And if, if, if that exists, uh, then, then you can make the argument that that's not a public disclosure. But yes, things like lab meetings or that are internal to the U, yes, we, we don't consider those to be public disclosures. So a follow-up question, if let's say we, we have a student, we have a thesis committee, that, and then one committee asks that university. So how we can proceed this while we take the rights, but so, so, yeah, the short answer is, if there's a gray area, you file something. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's actually been a, 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 a problem, especially in the post-COVID age, because it's, well, theoretically, a defense is open to the public. Nowadays, if they're conducted over Zoom and you don't have an invitation, you know, is that still the case? So actually, Rex, have you run into that? I haven't run into that particular issue, but uh, I are on the side of encouraging people to get applications on file if they're, uh, you know, a closed lab room meeting within a particular lab, I don't think presents an issue. But things that are done at a more broad level where there's not a reasonable expectation that someone's not going to go out and lab about it, th that creates a significant enough risk that I are on the side of getting an application on file. And one other context which, um, if, if you do defend, um, and that, that defense, even though it's not published, it later becomes indexed by the library, which can happen you know, a few weeks or months after the student graduates, that becomes prior art. And that's, that's true even if no one ever actually looks at that, that publication. So that, that's one thing that we've done before, is, and, the, and the library will actually embargo those presentations upon request. So that's something we'll frequently do is they'll give their defense, we'll file something, but we'll also embargo the actual thesis getting on file. So think about that when people graduate from their labs. Okay, I think we're nearly done here. Let's see, was there anything else? We've discussed free to operate there. Maybe the, the last thing I'll note is, is that I know so many of your companies depend on demonstrating to um, investors and others that you have obtained patent protection and that the, the patent process is slow. So for many of you, it will make sense to uh, expedite examination by filing what's called a track one request. This is simply, um, you pay a fee, and uh, subject to a couple other minor rules, your uh, application is advanced in the queue, and you'll get a, an, um, you know, a response from the, P, you know, two responses from the PTO within a year, at the patent office within a year of filing. It can make a world of difference, and so, um, especially in this context, we recommend that you just be aware of that and consider that when you're putting together your application. But I think that's our time, so thank you.